I'd like to just share a screen for those of you who are logging on uh, so that we could just go over the uh, logistics uh, for the program today. Um, Buenvenidos a todos. Uh, mi nombre es Roberto Mucaro Borrero y estoy, uh, voy a hacer el papel de moderador para el, web, el seminario de web de hoy, que es la defensa de nuestros derechos consagrados de en los tratados en la, la, la Borrero, en la and I will be the moderator for the presentation. Uh, just, okay. just so that uh, the, the, the webinar for. I'm just letting the, the folks know in Spanish in case they don't know they have to switch their channel at the moment. So um, just to share the screen with you, just give me a second here. So for those of you who are just logging on, uh, you'll see these instructions. I'll, I'll first present them in English. Voy a presentar uh, las instrucciones en inglés primero, después en español. So just uh, so that you know, you should have the most uh, updated version of Zoom. At the bottom of your page, uh, you'll see there's an interpretation icon. It looks like a globe. You'll see it here in this image. What you need to do is select English. You'll see that here where select the language, select English, and then mute original audio. Now this is important because if you don't select your language that you wanna hear and mute original audio, you will also hear the interpretation uh, throughout the presentations and that, that will be hard to follow. So then finally, uh, just for uh, when we do get time uh, towards the end, questions or comments should be sent using the chat icon. And again, if you look towards the bottom of your screen, you'll see it says chat, and that's where you can type in your questions. And please note that if we do not get to the questions or if we don't have time for too many questions, we do have all the contact information for the speakers at the International Indian Treaty Council website. Now, uh, for those in English, if you just give me another moment uh, of patience while we switch over to the Spanish. Y para los uh, que hablan español, Aquí son los introducciones, uh, los instrucciones para participar. Uh, lo que dice el icono de interpretación está en la parte inferior de derecha de su pantalla. Aquí es la imagen. Tú puedes ver la imagen del globo que dice interpretación. Seleccione español, Spanish. Después selecciones mute original audio. Aquí está presentado en inglés, pero es apagar el audio original. Y eso es muy importante porque si no Vas a escuchar los dos idiomas a la misma vez. So, entonces, ustedes seleccionen otra vez español, Spanish, y después apaga el audio original, mute original audio. Y para comunicarse durante el seminario de web, puede usar el icono de chat para mandar comentarios, y preguntas. Y aquí es la imagen uh, otra vez, chat. Y ahora voy a uh, devolver. Uh, in English, uh, para continuar. Uh, thank you everyone for your patience for that uh, brief introduction. And I wanna get right into our, our webinar. And at this time, I wanna introduce uh, Andrea Carmen. Uh, she's, the, she's from the Yaki Nation and she is the executive director of the International Indian Treaty Council. And she'll provide uh, an introduction and context for today's presentations. Andrea, you have the floor. Thank you uh, very much, Liosem Chaneabu, Mawayam. Respectful greetings to you, my relatives. Uh, I would like to um, begin by uh, sharing um, some slides uh, just to talk about the, uh, the work of the International Indian Treaty Council and how it began. We have um, some very distinguished panelists um, that will be speaking. Um, on the work of the IITC, how we began uh, with, to work on the issue of treaties. And I'm trying to see how to bring up um, a PowerPoint here with just a couple of slides. Uh, Chris, I think, is coming to help me. <laughs> but I, I wanted to begin by saying I'm from the Yaqui Indigenous Nation, and we are the only Indigenous nation 
um, in, um, yes, here we go, uh, in Mexico that from 400 years of, of warfare um, has a treaty uh, with the United Nations with you with the Mexican government and um, let me just bring this up this technology these technologies are still um, um, throwing us off a little bit um, but um, we began our work um, in 1974 with the declaration of continuing independence in which uh, that was held at Standing Rock um, Indigenous Nation, which most people have heard of now. Um, and uh, I think I still, there we go. Okay, um, and in the Declaration of Continuing Independence from June 1974, uh, the International Indian Treaty Council was formed and proclaimed that in the course of these human events, we call upon the people of the world to support this struggle for our sovereign rights and our treaty rights. Treaties between sovereign nations explicitly entail agreements which represent, quote, the supreme law of the land, that's from the US Constitution, in fact, binding each party to an inviolate international relationship. And that's what we're still talking about today in the context of um, the challenges faced by COVID-19. Our speakers are going to be talking about that from the point of view of their um, specific nations. And this is uh, just an example. One of our speakers is right in the middle of the screen. Uh, he hasn't changed much since, since uh, the 1977, the first uh, conference of indigenous peoples at the United Nations, where indigenous peoples, mainly of the Americas, participated to call on the United Nations to create a space for indigenous peoples and nations uh, to adopt a, a declaration on, on the collective rights of indigenous peoples, which of course happened in 2007, uh, that would also focus on treaty rights and um, also to recognize our, our space in the United Nations in the collective uh, world <clears throat> arena based on our treaties. And I think our speakers are gonna be talking about that a little bit more. Um, of course, in Article 37 of the UN Declaration is a clear recognition of our rights to have our uh, treaties recognized, observed, and enforced. And also reiterating that nothing in the Declaration can diminish the rights uh, that we have affirmed in our treaties, our nation to nation treaties. It was really important too that during the negotiations uh, for the UN Declaration um, to uphold and recognize free, por free prior and informed consent in many articles, not consultation, but consent, our right to say yes or no. Uh, we were able to refer not just to the Fort Laramie Treaty, uh, between the U.S. and what's called the Great Sioux Nation, the Ochete Sakoan, um, but also some of the um, Indigenous Nation treaties with Canada, that the right to free prior and informed consent, even before uh, non-Indians came onto our treaty lands, was already legally affirmed in these nation-to-nation -nation agreements. And the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty helped us uh, to obtain the recognition of that right uh, in the UN Declaration. Uh, and just to conclude um, and hand it over to our speakers that can um, talk much more about these issues and the specific ways that they're being implemented um, on treaty rights on the ground, especially now in the crisis that we're facing. I want to remind you that the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples has put out a call for information uh, relating to our rights um, that are being impacted by COVID-19 and understanding this is not just a health issue, it's a human rights issue, it's a treaty rights, a land rights, human rights defenders, all of these issues are um, uh, contained in the way that we're experiencing violations of our rights under COVID-19 and also the way that we're asserting solutions from within our own nations. Uh, these are the links to the questionnaire and you can find them on our website. Uh, and I invite everybody um, to send in their um, contributions. They will pre be presented by the Special Rapporteur, Francisco Cali Thai, 
um, to the UN General Assembly and submissions are due by June 15th of this year. And with that introduction um, and the um, appreciation to our distinguished panelists from the International Indian Treaty Council, I will turn the floor uh, back over to our moderator. Thank you, Joe uh, Home, Thank you, Andrea, for that uh, presentation and that overview, and also for providing uh, the information about the Special Rapporteur's report. Um, what folks can do uh, if you want to get uh, the links again uh, for to submit to that report visit the website of the international indian treaty council now for folks uh, who seem to have trouble um, trying to select the mute uh, button it is possible that you may not have the most updated version of zoom so if you still are getting both languages after you muted after you select your language and you muted the original audio, what I would recommend is signing off, shut, shutting off here, and then restarting so that Zoom will automatically update your subscription. Uh, this has helped others in the past during our webinars. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like, now like to move over to our next speaker. I have the great honor of introducing Mr. Bill Means of the Oglala Lakota Nation of South Dakota. He's a co-founder and board member of the International Indian Treaty Council. Bill, it's an honor to have you with us. You have the floor. What I did was give you a traditional greeting, said hello, my relatives. Today is a good day. And we've had a wonderful spring out here in the Dakotas, Lakota country. And uh, right now we're engaged in a heavy battle with the uh, coronavirus, as you know. It's affecting all of our people and the communities. However, right now, just to give you a quick update, Pine Ridge Reservation is in the southwest corner of South Dakota. We make up uh, over 2 million acres. Our reservation is 100 miles by 100 miles. We have approximately from 30,000 to 40,000 residents on our reservation, which sits uh, adjacent to Rosebud Reservation. We're all part of the same treaty. We speak the same language. And as a matter of fact, our language has uh, three different dialects that go all the way into Canada. So we have a big nation originally, and right now we're fighting to hold on to what little we have using our treaty rights. Right now we're engaged in a great land struggle because we have a lot of minerals in our sacred Black Hills. And so our job as treaty advocates is to, is to uh, promote the rights of our people all the way to the United Nations. Before we went to the United Nations in 1977, nobody recognized the rights of indigenous people, let alone our people here in the United States. But through the years, our people have become educated in the white man's law. And so now we can understand the principles on which to fight in the courts. And that is where we're engaged now in the Black Hills. For example, there are every uh, should we say, um, mineral companies, what they call the, uh, uh, all those that hunt for gold, hunt for oil, for the water, and uh, coal, the oil, all those things are in and around the Black Hills. So we're involved in a daily fight to protect what little we have left. The Black Hills, it's very sacred to our people. It was illegally taken from us in 1877 through an illegal act of Congress. And that's even in the Fed been documented in federal law. It's called United States versus Sioux Nation, in which we prove that the law of 1877 that took the Black Hills was totally illegal. And so that's kind of the background we're dealing with in these fights for our rights. 
And we have about eight reservations here in South Dakota and two in North Dakota. And then we also have reservations in Southern Canada. And so uh, all these lands together are called Ocheti Chakoin, which stands for seven council fires. That's our original government of our people that we still have. Uh, we're beginning to use in these court battles so that the United States courts can understand what is truly ours is not just Black Hills, not just Pine Ridge Reservation, but we go in at least four or five states and into Canada. So that's uh, where we are now is in a battle against this COVID. We have only 21 cases presently on our reservation of about, like I said, 35 to 40,000. And we have uh, a small hospital that takes care of all those people. And so with that kind of a background, we're battling, we have uh, put up, uh, actually we call them uh, road check. Yeah, there you go, you see it. Has, these are, we have a governor here that has chosen to take us on as a contrary, you know, she's always trying to look for some way to have a dispute with Indian people. And so now is a test of our sovereignty, a test of our treaty law. And so we because of these treaties, we have the right to defend our people and our land. And so we put up these checkpoints. They're not roadblocks, we call them checkpoints so that we know who's coming and going. We've already had various types of missionaries that brought the virus back to our reservations. In this modern day world, it's being repeated. It's almost as if they're bringing back the smallpox blankets. And so this is a kind of uh, comparisons that we use to get our point across to modern day educators and historians so they can remember the past, apply it to the future. What little we have left is not <coughs> territory. So let me kind of uh, pass it on. We'll have another young man by the name of Phil Two Eagle who'll be speaking on this subject. But these roadblocks, these checkpoints are very important to our people so that we not only stand up for ourselves because Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Indian Health Service, which are government agencies, they're not gonna protect us. They don't even have adequate supplies in their hospitals to take care of the people we have right now. We got uh, seven uh, respirators to take care of 35,000 people. This is an example. So we have to take care of ourselves, see who's coming and going. We've already had the experience of all these smallpox blankets. Of those of us that went to Vietnam, we had the experience Agent Orange, all these type of chemical warfare that's been perpetrated against our people. And so I'll turn this over to the speaker and uh, prepare for some questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill, for that for that wonderful overview and background and important information for historians and, and everyone else who's following these important developments as we deal with this pandemic as well as our treaty rights. Our next speaker uh, before to uh, Phil Two Eagle is uh, Janine Yazi. And uh, she's Dene. Uh, she's the IITC Sustainable Development Program Coordinator and New Mexico Navajo Hopi COVID Relief effort team leader. And she's gonna provide uh, an update on the COVID-19 crisis affecting the Navajo uh, Nation at this time. Uh, Janine, you have the floor. Hello all, um, thank you for having me uh, in discussing this very important topic that has come up a lot of times throughout our relief effort and both understanding the limitations and the access to resources and the history behind the endemic poverty and lack of critical infrastructure that our communities have or suffer from uh, as a result of just generations of treaty right violations and resource exploitation of our, our lands, territories, and resources. 
as, as everyone has been aware of um, because of national media and the national spotlight of, on our situation here on the ground, the Navajo Nation now has the highest rate per capita um, so per 1,000, every 1,000 citizens of the spread of the COVID virus among our, our, our people. And often in our relief efforts and in our conversations with state and federal representatives, as well as health providers and nonprofits and media, uh, I get the question, why is there such a high rate of cases on the Navajo Nation? And so it's pretty easy for them to see on the surface level that one of the causes is the lack of health care facilities to serve our nation, mm -hmm. as well as the lack of access to running water and electricity. But what remains a, a huge uh, gap in understanding is understanding the history of how we've come to live under these conditions. And one of the things that is not being addressed in all of this is the lack of water rights uh, for, my, for my people, for my nation. And the complicated history that has prevented um, securing through legal means uh, our, our right to water and water resources that run along the borders and, and into the territories of our people. And so there are two main tributaries that um, run adjacent to our nation, um, to the Colorado River, and that's the Little Colorado River and the San Juan River. And yet despite the, the fact that we're in such close proximity to this life force of the Southwest, we have been hindered in our ability to access it and use that water for the, the development and for um, the basic human rights that are necessary for our people. And a large part of this comes from the misunderstanding, uh, and it's, I wouldn't say misunderstanding, the willful ignorance on the part of states and corporations uh, of our treaty rights and our rights as a sovereign nation. And so for example, a lot of people know um, that the Navajo Nation is one of the only nations that has a treaty with the United States in the state of Arizona. Um, but on the New Mexico side, we're also only one of three nations that have a treaty with the United States. And most often, the treaty that is brought up are recognized by the states. When it is, is the Navajo Nation Treaty of 1868, which was um, entered into at Bosque Redondo, our Fort Sumner, during our capture and internment into that prisoner of war camp. Uh, but prior to that, there was another treaty, an earlier treaty that was entered into within the state of New Mexico or the government of New Mexico and representatives of the United States government um, that was established in 1849, known as the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And in both treaties was recognized the right of uh, Navajo people to their territories, to their hunting rights, to their ways of subsistence as well as rights that were preserved with the foresight of our leaders um, to, to uh, provide for a quality life for future generations, such as the right to education and to health care. Now water is a critical issue in the Southwest United States because without it, development and the survival of the cities and the states that depend on the Colorado River would not be possible. And so this is why there's a direct incentive to minimize and violate the rights of our nation and other tribal peoples, indigenous peoples uh, within the Southwest uh, so that they can minimize our claim to water. And so this comes into direct play when we're talking about COVID-19 impacts on our communities because a large cause of the spread is the lack of access to clean drinking water, the lack of water infrastructure that would enable households to perform self-isolation uh, and, and basic um, 
protocols such as washing your hands for 20 seconds, regularly doing your laundry and disinfecting your households. And so this limitation has had a direct impact on the ability of this virus to spread throughout households and impacting and taking from us entire families once it spreads. And so with the CARES Act and, and the 600 billion that has been, our, um, 600 million, I'm sorry, that has been allocated specifically to the Navajo Nation, uh, uh, there's, there's legal contention now about whether or not that money can be used to invest in the water infrastructure that is necessary to protect our people and to lay the foundation to prevent further loss of life should there be a second wave or a third wave or another pandemic. And again, it's because all of these conflicts are interrelated. And so it's extremely important that in this period, we all align to protect each other and to exercise not only our treaty rights, but our collective inherent rights to protect and sustain our nations, to protect and preserve our permanent homelands, and to ensure that all of our people have access to these human rights, such as the access to water, to healthcare, and to education. Um, and so we're going to continue to push from the grassroots to hold not only the federal government and states accountable, but also our tribal government accountable for representing what's in the best interest of our people based on the rights that were preserved by our ancestors in our treaties and in all of the oral histories that have been handed down through generations about what's important for our survival. And water is that basic necessity to, in, to promote water security, to food sovereignty, sovereignty and all of the rights that our people need and deserve to build sustainable futures. Thank you so much for that update, Janine, and for the important links that you made uh, between the COVID pandemic and water rights and our treaty rights. I think it's important information as, as Bill brought up, historian. Folks think about things in the past and they don't realize that these things have an active, are actively playing a role in the situation today. So it's greatly appreciated. And again, uh, prayers out to the community. I know we've, we've uh, continued to send prayers out to your community and many communities, all the communities that are uh, suffering uh, from the impacts of this uh, pandemic. I know right now we have a situation happening in Minnesota. We wanna send our good thoughts and prayers out, out to those folks as well. Right now, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. I have the great honor to introduce Phil Tu Eagle, who's the Executive Director of the Sikanju Lakota Treaty Council at Rosebud, South Dakota. Uh, Phil, you have the floor. I shake your hands with a good heart today. Um, thank you for uh, uh, allowing me to uh, talk for a few minutes on uh, treaty rights and uh, COVID-19 today. Uh, I wanted to uh, mention uh, something about the uh, 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. Uh, in that treaty, um, the uh, federal government uh, basically uh, agreed that uh, we had the uh, uh, total uh, and undisturbed, uh, we have the absolute and undisturbed use and uh, occupation of the uh, our treaty territory uh, that was guaranteed in our treaty. I uh, also want to mention article uh, uh, where the, um, they, they, um, the, according to the treaty, they would provide a, a health care through, through a physician. And uh, these are some of the, uh, that would be article uh, 13. Uh, you, the United States hereby agrees to furnish annually to the Indians, the physician, teachers, carpenters, uh, millers, um, but it's in the treaty. Um, we, um, we, stick, we stick to our 1851 and our 1868 treaties. Uh, we have our treaty boundaries um, and uh, we, um, we stand on those rights. But it's important to uh, me uh, mention that prior to the treaties, um, there were some things that, that happened to us, but um, before the ripe, uh, arrival of the Europeans, uh, we enjoyed a free and independent existence. And uh, we thought that by signing these treaties that we were gonna continue uh, uh, a level of uh, that way of life. 
um, we we had our own uh, language, we have our own history, we have our own culture, and uh, but uh, sometime in history there was uh, something people talk about is the doctrine of discovery, um, also known as a doctrine of domination, that which uh, leads into the uh, Johnson versus McIntosh, where they where the U.S. government uh, Judge Justice Marshall said that. Uh, the Indians had no right to uh, title to land that uh, we, we, we could only occupy. So that um, brings us to today. Uh, we lost a lot of land. To, we, we feel that all actions that were taken after the 1851-1868 uh, treaties, the congressional acts were unconstitutional and illegal. What you're looking at is the uh, 1851 treaty boundaries. Uh, those are, um, is our, our own area. The Lakota people, the, we call ourselves the Ocheti Shakoni. Uh, we don't like to be called Sioux. So we, there's a lot of work uh, involved in this. Uh, going forward, we need to correct a lot of the wrongs that uh, have been uh, done to us. Uh, we're not Sioux. We're, we don't call each other Sioux, and we don't like to be called Sioux. And so uh, we, uh, there's a lot of work that needs to go with the, uh, with the treaty work. Uh, right now, we're, not only are we uh, fighting this uh, COVID-19 uh, sickness, we have uh, depredations going on. We have the uh, oil and gas. You know, we have uranium mining. We have gold mining. Uh, we have uh, K uh, Keystone XL pipeline. We have the Quota Access pipeline. Uh, all of these um, depredation going, uh, attacking, uh, attacking our our people all at once, and these are uh, daily violations that we're uh, we're living with. Uh, we feel that it's genocide, the genocide that that's still alive and well today. So. Uh, uh, my uh, one of our leaders asked me to mention the uh, checkpoints that are happening. Um, we we feel that uh, we're standing on our inherent rights. We're we're this is our last probably our last uh, area of land that we have, we're going to occupy. So um, we have every right, uh, uh, inherent right as well as treaty rights, to to protect our own people. So we have. Uh, um, at times, our people implemented some COVID uh, strategies, and some of them were uh, curfews um, on the reservation. And uh, sometimes we do a lockdown when we feel that there's a, a hot spot going. So we uh, also uh, implement uh, uh, in the news. You'll hear that uh, Cheyenne River and the Ogallala uh, were implementing uh, checkpoints. Now we also are implementing checkpoints, but we do it during the times when we have to lock down the reservation. Um, there's, uh, uh, so the governor, uh, Governor uh, Christy Nome, has uh, reached out to President Trump to, uh, for help um, dealing with these checkpoints. But uh, we would like to uh, um, possibly uh, educate the governor on our, our treaty rights. If she uh, needs help with that, we, we need to uh, uh, maybe set up a uh, negotiation team and uh, give her a presentation. And then uh, we're willing to develop a, uh, a, list, a list of uh, uh, things that we can give to the governor on how she can work with us. Uh, we, she don't have to dictate to us. We, we are a sovereign nation and um, we, we have solutions. Um, this is how, um, um, according to treaties, uh, we can only um, work with a nation to nation basis, not government to government. Um, so uh, we stand on, on those inherent rights and uh, we're, we, want, we want to be able to uh, provide the solutions that are concerning uh, this governor. Uh, and then in the future, near future, you're going to probably see some of those uh, uh, a list of items coming from the tribes to uh, to the governor 
and, uh, uh, and probably telling her that this is how you're going to work with us and this is what we need in order to reach some kind of uh, peace and uh, uh, reconciliation with our tribes. So uh, I don't know if I have any more time. Uh, I want to say thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you so much, Phil, for that update and for providing that additional context and also expressing the willingness of, of your nation to enter into um, its rights under the treaty obligations to discuss with the, with the other governments surrounding uh, the area. It's, it's really an important update and we're very happy to have you with us today. Our next speaker is uh, Tetui Shortland. Uh, she's uh, Nagatehine, Nagati Raukawa Ki Te Tonga, Managing Director of Awatea from Aotearoa, New Zealand. I apologize, Tatui, if I pronounced any of that wrong. I, I tried, but uh, I don't speak the language. But uh, we're very happy to have you. It's, been a, it's uh, always an honor to work with you, and you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, kia ora everybody. Uh, it's great to join you all today, even though it's like 4.30 here uh, in Aotearoa, um, but only for the Indian Treaty Council I would do this. So thank you so much. And it's a blessing to hear firsthand uh, the struggles that are going on, uh, particularly in relation to treaties. Um, I run our family farm. Uh, currently, it's an organic heritage farm. It's a teaching and research farm located in Whangarei, uh, where we focus on providing nutritious organic heritage food, seed and medicine uh, to our communities. And uh, we focus on reconnecting people to land and evolutionary breeding for resilience in this changing climate. Um, that is, we practice growing with nature. We produce more food than the industrial agricultural systems, which dominate food production here in Aotearoa. We consider food to be the web of life, which is guaranteed under Te Tiriti or Waitangi, or the Treaty of Waitangi. Uh, the Treaty of Waitangi ensures our role and freedom to protect the integrity of nature. Before the signing of our Treaty, we were experiencing our agricultural revolution and largely living in peace. In fact, Māori have a natural genius for agriculture. Uh, heritage food here in Aotearoa is the most nutrient dense food in the world per acre. It's rooted in place, the seed teaches us generosity, the seed connects us to our ancestors, it helps us to commune with nature and with ourselves and industrial agriculture is impeding on the very basis of our survival. So in terms of the COVID, the COVID highlighted the issue that indigenous organic farmers here are not respected. We're invisible, and there are deep inequalities between indigenous and industrial farmers, despite the work we do to supply our people and our Māori communities with accessible good food. There were restrictions on accessing farm supplies, uh, on our, for our own farm, uh, restrictions on water and our travel. We had an increased presence of police in our communities who were taking liberties beyond their rights and trying to restrict our movement. We felt a heavy increase in their show of strength in our communities. We also cannot access any of the drought relief funds which are focused on industrial agriculture. Our certification costs are a hindrance for Indigenous peoples. And now the government is rushing through uh, all types of legislation. One that particularly uh, uh, impacts on us is the Organic Products Bill, uh, which submissions are open for right now. Uh, despite all of us being so busy still trying to get food and medicine to, into um, our Māori households. Uh, so within that bill, there's a need to have the exclusion of genetically modified organisms. The bill does not currently recognise the role of organic production on climate change, 
improvement of water quality and biodiversity. The bill needs to acknowledge the role of Indigenous peoples and ensure our leadership in the oversight of organic standards. Uh, so that's just a small picture of what we've been going through over the last few months. I also wanted to just touch briefly on the opportunities that we see uh, for the future. You know, in this time when everybody wants to reboot and talks about what could a new economy look like, um, our future, our, our food sovereignty helps us align to the natural biological rhythms as the earth turns through the seasons, tidal and lunar patterns, uh, which is, assist us to neutralize our free radicals. Food can be the foundation of the new economy. We conscious eaters are concerned with how Mother Earth was treated and how the farmer was treated in the production of that food. Working with the Earth, we make food better and respecting Indigenous treaty rights to food sovereignty, we make the world better. Kia ora. Thank you so much, uh, Tatui, for that presentation. We are um, very appreciative that you're here with us and uh, apologize for the, <laughs> for the time, but we really appreciate what you had to share. And, and I'm sure that those who are uh, listening in uh, are um, very interested uh, to see the, the comparisons between what's going on on this side of the world and what's happening on uh, your side of the pond, uh, so to speak. And uh, thank you for also highlighting the role of food sovereignty in our in in the challenges and our responses. I think it was uh, really important information. Well, right now um, I have uh, we're going to open up for questions. We do have another speaker scheduled, but he was in uh, a different meeting and was planning to come in a little bit late. That's uh, International Chief Wilton Littlechild from Canada. So. Um, while we're waiting, uh, I do have one question that came in for uh, Bill and Phil, uh, particularly. And uh, this question says, has the Trump administration responded to the request by the South Dakota governor to intervene to remove the checkpoints? And has the Osheti Shakoin considered their response uh, to this request? So either Phil or Bill, if you want to maybe try to answer that. Bill, uh, you're on. Uh, Bill, you're on mute. If you can unmute yourself, I could see that you were responding. And I think, yeah, Bill. So far, you're still on mute. And I believe that um, Phil had to step away for one moment uh, because of a ceremonial obligation, but he said that he will return. Uh, Bill is trying to unmute himself here. He has some assistance. Here we go. Now you're ready to go, Bill. Thank right, you very much. Got it. Yes. Well, we have, uh, you know, the governor said basically that they were going to take us to court. And then I think her staff started doing some research in regards to these cases of sovereignty and borders. And they found out uh, there was a case uh, as late as 1980, in which all highways going through or on reservations were subject to the jurisdiction of tribal court. And so that was a major victory that's already been taking place. And so she changed her tactics to say that she would like the federal government justice department to look at it as a criminal manner. So trying to criminalize this issue, she has presented a bunch of documents to the Attorney General of the United States. Because as you know, the state of South Dakota has no jurisdiction on a reservation. So what she's trying to do is impose state jurisdiction on highways. And so far we haven't heard from her or the Justice Department Justice Department is a federal agency. It's supposed to represent American Indians as a uh, priority over states. But yet she's trying to use them to, I guess, in the spirit of racism, to uh, override legitimate federal court cases 
to allow her to impose federal jurisdiction on reservation highways where they have no jurisdiction. So we look forward to, and we told her many, many times, trying to be diplomatic, that we look forward to seeing her in court. And so rather than for her to take us individually to court as a tribe and a state, she's trying to involve the U.S. Department of Justice. And I don't think she's going to get anywhere. I think it's a lack of knowledge, first of all, between uh, her and the court system of the United States and how federal and state courts work. And so we're not afraid to go to court at all. We have treaties that back what's going on in the state and federal court. So treaties are the supreme law of the land as stated in Article 7 of the United States Constitution. So we stand on firm legal grounds. And we wish that she'd take us to court so that we can begin to clear up this legal mess that she's created through the attitude of domination, through the attitude of extending racism beyond the borders of their county jurisdiction, their state jurisdiction. So we, we look forward to seeing her in court or we look forward to seeing her at the negotiation table. Thank you so much uh, for that. And uh, we do have a couple other questions coming in. Um, let me uh, just take this, this uh, first one here. This is from, uh, looks like Sherry Green. Uh, are there any, are any of the tribes considering investing and partnership with investors to address infrastructure with any funding from the CARES Act. I think uh, Janine had mentioned the CARES Act in, in her uh, presentation. But again, the question uh, from uh, like Sherry Green, are any of the tribes considering investing and partnership with investors to address infrastructure, et cetera, with the funding from the CARES Act? Uh, I can um, provide a partial answer uh, and then also a recommendation. Um, the CARES Act is subject to a lot of different legal interpretations right now in terms of how it can be used or not used. But one of the things that it says in there is that it cannot be used to create any type of economic benefit or profit uh, for the tribal nation. And another issue is that because it is, um, it seemingly has a limitation to only be about any necessary response to COVID-19 that was not otherwise uh, appropriate, had it had, that did not otherwise have an appropriation through the current tribal budgets, that it's really, um, it's going to be difficult to make the argument that longstanding infrastructure needs are eligible for the, the um, for use of the funds that were made um, to respond to COVID. And so this is, you know, why in my, earlier in my presentation, I said our tribes, especially treaty tribes, really need to work and share information with each other and how we're being advised about what the CARES Fund can and cannot be used for. Because we need to stand on our treaty rights and our inherent rights to do what's best for our people. And this is gonna be even tr more true and more relevant when it comes to the legal interpretation of what qualifies as eligible expenses with the CARES Act, because our tribes may be told to something different depending on who we have advising our nations. And we need to make sure that we're standing in solidarity to be able to use these very necessary but also very late relief funds to address the systemic issues that made our communities disproportionately vulnerable in the first place. And I really do hope that we can find that partnership that will allow us to address these longstanding systemic issues that have prevented the development of critical community infrastructure to this day. Thank you. Thank you, I have a short comment to add is that many of our Indian, especially treaty nations, we consider these not to be grants, 
are not to be aid to our people. These are treaty obligations. And so they're in a whole different legal category in terms of federal funding. So from an Indian perspective and Indian court perspective, we say we could use this as necessary. We shouldn't have to go through uh, these rules and regulations put forth to cities and towns. We're not cities and towns, we're nations. So under the last administration, we had a higher standing in terms of understanding the legal rights of Indian people, that we are a nation, and if we had a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with the last administration, made it a lot easier. So thank you. Thank you very much for that addition. I don't know if any of the other uh, panelists uh, want to add anything in, but I do have a question for uh, Tetui. Uh, the question is, are the Maori utilizing any checkpoints uh, to protect their territories as we have seen in some of the nations here in on this side? Oh, kia ora. Yes, yes, we are. And uh, we, we still have checkpoints, even though uh, our levels of um, isolation have uh, changed. You know, our schools have reopened. Now you can meet again as, you know, 100 or so people. Uh, but we still, because of the past um, pandemics that have been, uh, that have crushed our communities, uh, there were uh, many isolated areas that were closed off. Um, even if you were from the community, but you lived in the city for a long time, there were restrictions on you as well. And um, internally, communities looked after elderly and vulnerable through prov provision of food. Uh, so currently, um, even some sacred areas have been closed as well, and there are currently a lot of debates about whether to reopen them. Uh, so it's really good that our Indigenous communities have taken that proactive position around their sovereignty and uh, their management of, um, you know, their territories during these times. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question here from uh, Bina Lakshmi Nipram. Uh, I think the first part of her question has been addressed. She was asking about using uh, COVID-19. Uh, have some of the treaty obligations been violated uh, in the U.S. and what steps have been taken to address the issue? I think the issue of the checkpoints is, is one of those, but if anybody wants to expand on that, uh, they, they're more than welcome. But the second part of her question is, how are indigenous peoples planning to address racism against indigenous peoples, which is on the rise? Uh, for example, as she's seeing uh, racism against indigenous peoples in Manipur in Northeast India, uh, where they're being thrown out of rented apartments, prevented from uh, entering groceries, uh, spat upon, uh, et cetera, because they're calling them uh, carriers of the virus. Uh, do we see any uh, similarities happening amongst uh, your communities? This again is open to any of the, any of the panelists. Uh, this is Bill Means. I'll say uh, just real quickly, we have this, we call it a John Wayne mentality because we come from rural communities in the United States, there's still those people that believe that because they're white, they have more rights than Indian people. They said, we fought you, you lost, we won. That kind of an attitude. We call South Dakota the Mississippi of the North. And so we have many cases of racism constantly, whether it's individual treatment of people in retail markets, or whether it's in land issues in the courts, uh, we see a tremendous prejudice by our courts in dealing especially with land rights. And so I'll just leave it there and the extent is permeates throughout society. Thank you so much, Bill. I see that uh, for that clarification and before any of our other panelists uh, want to weigh in, if they do, we'll come back to this question uh, after I see that our speaker, uh, Chief Wilton Littlechild, is on. 
Um, I, so I just want to uh, provide that opportunity for him to make his presentation and then we can revert back to some of the questions that are coming in. We have a number of questions that are entering now and uh, we'll make sure that we address those in our second round of questions. But I just want to say and have the honor, the great honor to introduce uh, Wilton Littlechild, who is the International Chief for Treaties 6, 7, and 8 uh, he, in, in Canada. He is from the Ermanskin Cree Nation, and uh, he's calling in from Alberta, Canada. Uh, Chief Littlechild, uh, if you can, unmute your mic and you have the floor. I don't see the mic unmuted as yet, but I do see that he is in the queue. So maybe uh, we can uh, just move to another question while he attempts to work with his microphone. And then after uh, we see the microphone unmuted, we can come back to International Chief Little Child. I apologize uh, for that. But uh, let's uh, go to one of our other questions uh, before, uh, while we're waiting for that technical issue to be addressed. Um, here's a question from Andrew Reed. Could someone discuss the, col the colonial or Western destruction of native medicine and remedies and the lack and the subsequent lack of availability of traditional remedies to treat COVID-19 problems, such as respiratory issues and the making of, uh, this is the second part of the question, and the making of traditional remedies uh, available more widely. So again, uh, can someone discuss the destruction of native medicine and, me and remedies and the lack of, of, of availability in the communities? This is open to all the panelists. I can um, briefly address that from the perspective of the Diné Nation. Um, you know, like with the Indigenous Religious Freedom Act not being passed until the late 70s, a lot of the ways that we cultivated and use our traditional medicines were directly incorporated into ceremony. And so not having the ability to put, conduct those ceremonies and practice those ceremonies really hindered a lot of the transference of knowledge around how to um, gather and appropriately prepare a lot of our medicines. And this has been really critical and was raised immediately um, at the onset of COVID-19 because there have been times in our historic memory and in our oral traditions when, for example, there was the Spanish flu, um, we had a hunter virus outbreak in the early 90s, and we had um, uh, in between that several other uh, health pandemics in which our our people had no other way to address this than relying on their traditional medicines. And it is widely believed, and it has been the experience that those traditional medicines really helped our people in those critical times when access to other healthcare and vaccines and other medical remedies from the Western world were, were not available because of the generations of, of violation of treaty rights and again, the lack of infrastructure and all of those things. And so when this, when COVID-19 came to our territories, that would, became an immediate question, but now we're dealing with a different type of threat. And that is that um, what, when people wanted to uh, start to highlight and bring forth herbs and medicines and share with each other that knowledge, uh, there's a lot of hesitancy, hesitancy, rightfully, about doing that through public platforms like the internet, social media, and yet that's one of the main ways that our communities can share that knowledge. And that hesitancy comes from the fact that, uh, you know, what we've experienced as, as, as a whole with White Sage and the commercialization of that, once it's medicinal and, and um, uh, therapeutic properties were understood by the Western world, that type of knowledge extraction is still endangering um, the, the, the um, prevalence and the use uh, and misuse of our, of our traditional, uh, leading to the misuse of our traditional medicines. And so, um, you know, this is something that's going to be ongoing that we're going to have to continue to discuss, especially since a lot of people are using traditional remedies successfully to treat 
treat COVID-19 in the early stages. But, you know, the fact that we have to do research and we have to collect data and really extract what works and why our traditional medicines work, this is make, tr making traditional practitioners very wary about um, continuing in that process um, in a public manner. Thank you very much, uh, Janine, for that. Uh, there was another question that came in, and I don't know if this is something that uh, Tatui uh, might want to speak to, but uh, basically because she did uh, talk a little bit more about uh, food sovereignty, but this is a question coming from uh, Chiapas, Mexico, from uh, Valeria Garcia Lopez. And she's basically uh, suggesting that while uh, indigenous peoples are confronting uh, the systems, the local systems, the food systems, and confronting these challenges, you know, this has brought uh, a more visibility to the importance of food sovereignty, uh, food security, and, uh, uh, and our seeds. And uh, she was wondering if you could just elaborate a little more on this, on this issue, that, that uh, connection between uh, food sovereignty uh, the pandemic and, and indigenous re resistance and, and resilience uh, from your perspectives. Again, this is open to uh, any of the any of the panelists. Kia ora. Uh, yes, we were we were due to host a uh, a farm workshop to share um, on how to grow and how to use our native seeds and medicine. Uh, and then we had the lockdown, so we had to shift to, as everybody else has, to these Zoom meetings and these Facebook Lives and things like that, which we'd never done before. And um, people were hungry for good content. And the opportunity uh, to share around Indigenous food sovereignty just blossomed. Uh, in the last month, I think we've had. Uh, something like 30,000 people follow us on our Awatea page and we need to embrace it because before we were somewhat unpopular um, but now there's not only in our Māori communities but also um, a, a, a growing respect in, in the local cities for buying local food and local medicine and fortunately we had a lot of supply of traditional medicine uh, that was good for respiratory issues as well. And uh, it was all dried and, and ready to go out and we harvest again uh, in another month's time. Uh, and I just wanted to draw on a, a follow on um, what Janine said uh, in response to the, the native medicine uh, question. You know, there has been a war that has been waging against uh, Mother Nature, and therefore our seeds and our medicines since the world wars. And um, we need to go back and replant our areas and share with our schools and uh, work with other communities and share our strategies across the waters as well to take up the opportunities around our food sovereignty and share openly that seed because the seed teaches us uh, multiplicity, the seed teaches us generosity, the seed connects people deeply uh, in a manner that is also medicinal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tatui, for that. Um, as uh, another indigenous peoples who are connected to the ocean, I can relate uh, to that and, and fully agree that you know, it's time for us to share. And, and I think that that was a question that some people had posed in the chat, but I think both the responses from Janine and yourself have addressed that issue. There is another uh, comment and question, and I think this one could go to, um, to Bill Means. Uh, this comment is uh, from uh, Maori Elisar. Uh, I, I hope I pronounced that right. And the comment is as follows. It has been a strategic tactic of genocide to cut off food, water, and cultural uh, and other cultural uh, sustenances. And uh, he goes on to write, I felt hopeful when I read 
the Sierra organization worked with Rosebud to establish uh, the largest buffalo herd. Is that true? Uh, so Bill, I guess the question is, is was there uh, an initiative between the Sierra and Rosebud to establish uh, this buffalo herd? And is that part of uh, the food sovereignty response? Uh, yes, most definitely. And I think uh, the food they're first starting with is the buffalo, which as you know, is native to North America. And we will end up having the largest herd. We already have probably an upwards of five to 600 buffalo on the reservation currently. But what we wanna do is not, in, not only involve Sierra Club, but some federal agencies which are willing and have in the past done some real good work in terms of conservation and uh, preservation of the buffalo. So not only do we have uh, the physical animal being promoted in a healthy way, in a way of food sovereignty, but also along with the buffalo comes a lot of ceremony, a lot of certain parts of the buffalo being used for certain ceremonies. So a lot of our children get the opportunity to relearn some of the specifics of these buffalo ceremonies and how we care for the buffalo and what the medicine means to our people. So that's, uh, it's kind of a two prong approach to educate uh, the educator about what the buffalo means to our society, but also in a spiritual way. And then also to preserve the animals in a good way so that they thrive because this is buffalo country. It's not made for cows. The buffalo doesn't, should we say, defecate in its own clean water, for example, as a cow does. So that in alone tells you the difference between our people's diet and the diet of the beef structure of the world. So yes, we can, uh, we hope to have this uh, program up and running. Uh, parts of it are already, but as we bring in federal agencies and other partners to, uh, maintain the scientific benefits, but also teaching our people we can maintain two pathways of education. So thank you for that question. Thank you so much uh, for elaborating on that, Bill. I believe that our final speaker is uh, ready to take the floor. As I introduced him earlier, we're uh, hoping to hear now from International Chief Wilton Littlechild, is the International Chief for uh, Treaty 6, 7, and 8 in Canada. He's a member of the Ermanskin Cree Nation, and he's uh, calling in from Alberta, Canada. Uh, Chief Littlechild, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I want to bring greetings to all my fellow panelists and thank the IITC for hosting this uh, timely and very, very important webinar on COVID-19. My chief's name is Osaugehil, a Cree name that was given to me in ceremony on the occasion of being appointed a chief for Treaty 6, 7, and 8. In English, it means golden eagle. I'm absolutely honored to be a member on this panel, as treaty has been a way of life for me ever since my grandparents uh, raised me. After uh, also being brought to residential school. I spent 14 years in residential schools and my grandfather's name was Mahikant Mohte and um, whom I'm also named after uh, as a chief. He was chief for over 30 years and it's said that at one time during his chieftainship there was an epidemic in our nation and he had to bury 33 members of the nation in one day. And the backdrop to my presentation is to 
note that the treaties and the UN declaration really work hand in hand together. As I say, and you'll see on the slide, the eagle represents us as First Nations on, a, on, on one wing, uh, represents the treaties, and on the other wing, it represents the UN Declaration. So it takes both wings for our um, rights uh, to be lifted up and uh, uh, given meaning and for ability to, to soar. So it's from that perspective, I want to make some comments on the theme, defending our treaty rights during this time of a coronavirus pandemic. Um, before I do begin though, I wanted to go back to the original instructions our elders gave us back in 1977, when we began this international work. They told us that inherent right to self-determination and Cree government, which is our government, and in our language, is one of the four uh, instructions we can never step back from. Secondly, the original spirit and intent of treaty, and that treaties are sacred agreements. We say in our language, um, they said it was very important for our treaty partners to understand the Cree understanding of treaty, not just the written text, but also uh, the oral testimony. And thirdly, that treaty, of course, is a mutual respect arrangement. They pay me win. That's what we say in our language when we say uh, we consent to an agreement. And lastly, uh, it's about peaceful coexistence and mutual responsibility to honor these international treaties. And the words we have for that in our language is we thuski you in. And we're reminded daily or in ceremonies at least that these treaties were to, to last as long as the sun shines, the grass grows and the rivers flow. So this is the backdrop to um, my presentation. I have in, um, um, been also the Grand Chief for Treaty Number no. Six um, and, its, and its adhesions. Um, but how we took assertive action and proactive decisions uh, in order to implement our treaty is what I want to, to um, talk about today. Um, as the elders said to us, it's important that we activate our treaty right to health, um, that it's important to implement our inherent right to self-determination. And as you know, these are underpinned by the UN Declaration and the Organization of American States, the OAS uh, Declaration. And in the UN Declaration itself, it's important that we reflect on one of the preambles, which says that considering that the rights affirmed in treaties, agreements between states and indigenous peoples, are in some situations matters of international concern, international interest, international responsibility, and international character. So this COVID-19 is exactly that. It's an international matter, and it's of international concern. And that's why I'm so honored to be able to share um, some thoughts with you uh, on this topic from that perspective. You'll note that in the UN Declaration, uh, Articles 3, 4, 24, and 37 are all very relevant uh, to this uh, topic. And for example, the OAS Article 28 as well. So I should share, we were told in ceremony uh, about two grandfather's dreams. The grandfather uh, years ago apparently had a dream that something was coming. He could not identify what it was. It said it didn't have a name, but it was bad and it's coming. And then in another ceremony, we were told 
a different grandfather had also had a dream, but in that dream, a little boy came to his dream, and the little boy told, told him about um, this um, um, matter uh, that was coming as well. So in old days, our forefathers already knew this. So it was important, um, for example, um, in the 1918 influenza pandemic, the use of such treatments as the ancient use of um, uh, sweat lodges, the tribal communities, traditional healing methods were used because back then that particular approach of using traditional medicine was uh, responsible for reducing hospitalization among our peoples, our indigenous peoples um, by, by some 25% and actually saved uh, many lives. So at Treaty 6, 7, and 8 in our territories, we've invoked our treaty right. We are aware, of course, there's a, an international general public human right to health, but there's also a national and provincial health framework. But we here at Mascochis chose to invoke our treaty right to health in particular, the medicine chest clause. And you'll see on a slide now, or it was just on a slide, uh, there's a very important element of the uh, treaty. Uh, so when you look at our treaty, it was um, agreed to back in 1876. Our nation here adhered to that treaty in 1877. But you'll notice that back then already our forefathers had the wisdom to include in the treaty that in the event hereafter in 1877 of the Indians comprised within this territory of Treaty 6 being overtaken by any pestilence or by a general famine, the queen on being satisfied and certified thereof by her Indian agents will grant to the Indians assistance of such character and to such extent as her chief superintendent of Indian affairs shall deem necessary and sufficient to relieve the Indians from the calamity that shall have befallen them. So we use this part of the treaty, 1876 treaty, to proclaim uh, or declare a state, uh, a state of emergency uh, in our communities. There's also a second clause in the same treaty, which is called the medicine chest clause uh, that shall be kept at the house of each Indian agent for use and benefit of the Indians at the direction of such agent. But it's important to also understand that this is the English version of what our forefathers uh, said. When uh, this has been taken to court, it's been mischaracterized. It's actually a total holistic right to health. As you know, our peoples, we take a look at health from a holistic perspective, both the, uh, the physical and the mental, uh, the cultural, and very, very importantly, the spiritual element of health. So back then already, uh, our forefathers have ensured that it in an inch like where we are today with COVID-19, that government has to honor and respect our treaty right to health, in particular with regard to a pestilence like um, the coronavirus uh, that's befallen um, among our people. So here in my community, um, we've looked at the impacts that we've had uh, in other areas. Uh, most people look at it as an economic crisis. Others looked at it as a health crisis, but it was important for our elders to um, make clear that we should also consider that it's a spiritual crisis. So we've been having ceremony. We've been having traditional healing ceremonies 
every week we've had prayer circles uh, ongoing uh, on a daily basis. We've been using our traditional medicines. I heard one of the speakers just mention traditional medicines. I myself have for, for the last seven weeks have been taking uh, traditional medicines. Um, so we rely on our own uh, healing uh, ceremonies. For example, the, uh, a sacred uh, tea dance that was done in the old days when there was an epidemic or a serious uh, assault on our communities by, uh, for example, the measles blankets and so on. We have a, a local emergency response team that really went to action. I just want to quickly go over some of the aspects that they, they put into uh, effect in our community for a particular reason. Uh, the um, uh, state of emergency declared a lockdown in our community. So all our four uh, community, the reserves of 18,000 residents and members, uh, there's only one entry and one exit to, to the reserve. And also, if you're in a vehicle, you cannot have more than two uh, people in the vehicle. You're asked where you're gonna go. It's under security for 24 hours, where you're coming from, and when you will be uh, leaving. Uh, all the schools have been closed, but we've also converted one of the schools as a, a temporary facility should we need it for uh, uh, isolation. Uh, in the event that one of our members uh, unfortunately gets um, um, struck uh, by the, the illness. We have neighbor communities. There's 24 First Nations as a community that have been absolutely devastated by, by, the, uh, uh, by the disease that uh, has hit their community. Um, but we've had our business is closed. We've had good if, um, cooperation with our police, policing, the our RCMP, uh, and the health workers, the frontline workers, which I really want to thank um, them for their um, efforts. Um, we, we've also been able to share with our neighbor uh, treaty territories, for example, Treaty 4, 5, 8, and 10, uh, seven, eight, and ten um, to work together uh, in, in this uh, at time of uh, uh, calamity, I'll say, for, uh, for our communities. I want to uh, specifically note, because in, in, in thanking our leaders for uh, making a very difficult decision, for example, to have a curfew in our communities of uh, 10 o'clock every night. So we've had these stringent measures uh, declared by our leadership. But we noticed that uh, there's some impact from a cultural perspective uh, in terms of the social distancing that's been enforced. Um, for example, for our weeks when we have a death in a community, we've had several deaths in the last two months in our community, but none, none of them have been uh, COVID related. So we have our wakes, our funerals, our feasts, uh, those have been restricted to, uh, to some extent. So in closing, I'm very grateful to all the very hardworking frontline workers in our nations, the families coming together, elders and spiritual leaders continuing to pray for all of us, just everyone willing to help each other. Leaders working together, our ancestors, who in their wisdom, as I said, foresaw the days that we might need help and ensured there was included in our treaty, a medicine chest clause, a famine and pestilence clause that would help us in times um, like right now. So I wanna thank our creator, the great spirit, or however you acknowledge our Creator, for ongoing blessings. And I pray for everyone to continue to be safe and healthy. And thank you very much.
Uh, it's due to everyone's efforts in Treaty 6 territory. We have no cases in Treaty 6 territory. There's not one case of um, coronavirus and that covers a territory um, of uh, 16 First Nations and all of Central Alberta, uh, where we do have not had uh, this. And I really believe it was because of our holistic approach to health. We made sure that not only is it physical and mental health, but our cultural ceremonies, our traditional ceremonies, mainly the prayers of our elders uh, ongoing that really helped us to defend our community uh, from this virus. So thank you uh, to everyone. We will get through this and we will get through it stronger um, because of it. So thank you very, very much. Hi, hi, Kilgin and Askums. No, thank you. Hahom, Kasike, little child. Thank you, uh, Chief Little Child, for that uh, important contribution to today's discussion, which has been um, a learning experience, but also um, really important, I guess, for so, for so many, just to hear how uh, our treaties are connected uh, to, this, to this crisis that's going on and, and what our communities, uh, not only across the hemisphere, but across the world are doing uh, in response to uh, the challenges and also the opportunities. Uh, we have just a few minutes left, so I, I just want to let folks know who are listening in that uh, next week, uh, next Friday, same time, we will be having another uh, ITC webinar. And uh, this time we will be talking about uh, the impacts of COVID-19 on uh, Indigenous women and children. So I hope that you can all uh, check out our sites and our social media uh, uh, at uh, International Indian Treaty Council to get the updates uh, of, we're gonna have a, a really another stellar lineup of speakers, uh, including folks from South America, from Africa, et cetera. I wanna just take a moment just to thank once again, all of our speakers, again, for me as uh, an indigenous person, a Taino, who is a descendant of the first peoples in this whole Western hemisphere who entered into a treaty with uh, a quote unquote European nation. You know, this has been a fascinating and important and inspirational discussion. Um, uh, for me personally. And I want to thank uh, Andrea Carmen for our introduction, uh, Bill Means, Janine Yazi, Phil Two Eagle, International Chief Little Child, and of course, Tatui Shortland for all being here with us uh, today. I also want to thank our translators, uh, Daniel Tamayo and Jimmy Clark, uh, for their important work translating so that we can have uh, this important information reach that many more people. It's, it's really important to do that. We've had uh, really some great comments from uh, so many people around the world who have enjoyed today's presentation. And with that, I want to close up and say again, thank you to our behind the scenes persons like uh, Chris Honani and Amy Juan for helping to set uh, this up and all of these up. We do hope to have the recording up at the ITC website. Uh, for folks who are asking, keep checking back there, or check our social media. So with that, I want to once again say uh, thank you sisters and brothers for everything that you shared today, for all your important knowledge and all our prayers again for all the work uh, that you all do uh, on the ground level. So this is uh, Roberto Mucaro Borrero uh, signing off for the International Indian Treaty Council. Hey, hey.